told you that one of the things that I wanted to do with Uncharted was I wanted to dive deeper uh, into the Sunday sermons uh, that I, I just don't have time for on Sundays. And so I want to do that today. And so we're going to begin in Ephesians chapter 4. It's not, really, it's not really the beginning place of the Bible study, but I want to show you what caused the Bible study, the springboard for the Bible study. Now we're we're uh, studying grace and uh, studying the symbols of grace, the baptism and the Lord's Supper. We're studying uh, the, the unique gifts of grace that we're going to find right here in Ephesians chapter 4. So on Sundays, we're still going to be in Ephesians 4 for a while. But there is a very difficult passage right here in the middle of Ephesians chapter 4 that I just do not have the time to deal with on Sunday morning. So... We're going to deal with it today, and I think, uh, I think you will find this Bible study rather enjoyable. So Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7, remember Ephesians is our primer on grace. We're studying grace, for by grace you're saved, through faith, that not of yourself, it's a gift of God. All of these things, we're talking about grace. So when we find in chapter 4, verse 7, of word about grace, we are not surprised, but grace is given to each of us. Now, this is not the saving grace because saving grace is given to each of us in the same measure. The uh, 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 African isn't saved different than an American, that is not saved different than an Asian, who's not saved different than a South American, who's not saved different than uh, uh, anybody else. You're not saved differently because of your race or your ethnicity or your language or your education or your social standing. Uh, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. So verse 7 says, grace is given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. This is an individual grace. And he's going to talk about this. And let me just, here, let me just help you. Skip all the way down to verse 11. So when he talks about these grace gifts, these unique grace gifts, he says, and he gave some to be apostles and some to be prophets and some to be evangelists and some to be shepherds and teachers. And, and these, are just, uh, <coughs> these are just some of the various gifts that he gives us. We know from other passages in 1 Corinthians and Romans that some have given the gift of service and some have given the gift of hospitality and some are given the gift of administration and some are given the gift of, of healing. Some are given, uh, some are prayer warriors. So we have all, all these different kinds of gifts. And so you have a unique set of gifts that God has given you and you're already unique. You are, a, you are your own person. There's not another person like you on the planet. God loves uniqueness. And so while we're all saved in the same way through Jesus Christ and Jesus alone, after that, the Holy Spirit takes each one of us and we all have a different place in the body of Christ. Now, right smack dab between verse seven, which we read together, and verse 11, which we read together, this is what the Apostle Paul says. So he says, so each one of us have different grace gifts according to the measure of Christ's gift. Verse 8, therefore, and he's going to quote uh, the psalmist. I think it's the 68th Psalm. When he ascended on high, he led uh, a host of captives and he, and he gave gifts to men. And now, in a parenthetical statement, the Apostle Paul says, as if, as if we all know what he's talking about, well, in saying he ascended, see, he's now, he's now giving us, he's a commentary on the Old Testament quote from the psalmist. In saying he ascended, that doesn't make any sense. What does that mean? Unless he also descended into the lower regions of the earth. And in verse 10, he says, and he who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And then he says, and he gave some to be apostles and so forth. And you know exactly what that means, right? Should we close in prayer? <laughs> you read that and you're like, well, just, you're just go like, what? Wh wh what? Just right in the middle of that, it says, well, it doesn't make any sense to say he ascended if he didn't descend. And he who descended, and then he didn't say to earth, but to the lower regions of the earth, then ascended. What is it that the apostle Paul is talking about. I'm going to do my very best to help you with that this morning. So, got my trusty whiteboard here with me, and uh, like 
usual with me, we'll put our timeline up here. And whenever we're talking about anything that's biblical, then the the middle of that, the heart of that is always the cross of Christ, right? If you can come up with a biblical explanation for something theological and you haven't referred to the cross, you're probably wrong. And so I always want to start with the cross of Christ. So when we consider what uh, the uh, writer here, the Apostle Paul is talking about in Ephesians, we actually got to stop and kind of go backwards just a little bit. Now, you might have a guess, right? The scripture says here in uh, verse 9, he who ascended descended into the lower regions of of the earth. Now, we're not talking geology. We're talking spiritual things. So spiritually, what is always characterized to us as in the lower regions of the earth? Hell. So we got to stop and talk about heaven and hell and eternity. And then we will come back to Ephesians 4 when we kind of got this all worked out in our minds. Now, the cross is the dividing point because what happened in eternity before the cross is not the same thing that happens in eternity after the cross. Before the cross, there was a place called paradise. And uh, this is a place that the scripture uses some, some, to us, it sounds like funny language. You would say of Old Testament saints that they were gathered to their people. Did you ever read that in your Bible? Uh, Moses was gathered to his people. Abraham was gathered to his people. It's 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 a very interesting phrase and it always refers to death. It's the description of a death and Moses will be gathered to his people. And so uh, paradise is this place that exists before the cross. And I'm gonna give you some scriptures. I don't have the time to, to, to look them all up, but I want you to know them and you can scratch them down or, or, or whatever. But in, uh, in uh, Luke chapter 16, Jesus tells a story And it's the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Remember the story? Rich man had all kinds of things when he was here on earth. Lazarus didn't have anything. But the real key was that the rich man was not a believer and Lazarus was a believer. Now, this story is not made up. All the parables, let me say it the other way around. None of the parables ever list somebody by given name. It says there was a farmer that went out to sow. There was, a, there was a man who was going to travel to a far country, and so he gave his 10 talents to one, five talents to one, why do it? Never is a name mentioned. But in this particular story, Jesus is telling us a firsthand story, and we don't know the timetable, except that uh, I can tell you we know it's before the cross. Uh, Jesus is telling it that there was a guy named Lazarus. Now, he doesn't mention the name of the rich man, but they both died. And he said, and Lazarus went to, and then he says this phrase, he went to Abraham's side, is what you'll find there in Luke chapter 16. Or in the old King James, to Abraham's bosom. He went to Abraham's side, and he's talking about paradise. And then he says, and the rich man died, and as Jesus tells the story, he said he went uh, to a place of torment. And in rich man also died in a place of torment. He looked up. In the, in the Old Testament, this is always called, it's the Hebrew word shul. So, um, th- by the way, this is a great way to cuss. If, you, if, you're, uh, you just, if you're trying to break your ha- bad, and you're, if you're always using uh, hell as a cuss word, then just switch to Hebrew and just go sheol. Then no one will know. Uh, so, um, so what we discover is that before the cross, those saints who were believers did not go directly to heaven because the work of the cross had not been done yet. They, they were awaiting the completion of the work of the Son of God. Now, they went to a wonderful place. This is not a place of torment, but it is a place of waiting. It's 
It's a little bit like a waiting room. There's, a, there's another reference to paradise. You find it in Luke chapter 23. Jesus is on the cross. You know the story. Everybody's mocking him, including one of the thieves who's being crucified at the same time. But the other thief uh, rebukes the first thief and he says to Jesus, I, w- I want you to think about the incredible faith when he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. What kingdom? Jesus is dying just like he is. He, he, gets, he gets that it's spiritual. And, and Jesus says to him, today you will be with me in paradise. It's not a synonym for heaven. It's a different place. Today you will be with me in paradise. So uh, um, paradise is this, is this place of waiting for the messianic work uh, of Jesus to be done, the redemptive work of Jesus to be done. And this is where the Old Testament saints were. Now, God did not have to wait for those who are unbelievers. They, They didn't have to be in a waiting room because they have already rejected God and he is right and righteous in his judgment to send them to torment because nothing has to happen for them to go to torment. Do you understand that? If, if you and I don't receive Christ, hell is what I deserve. And, and so there is, there is nothing that has to happen there. Remember the story of the rich man and Lazarus? The rich man looked up and he saw Abraham and Lazarus by his side. He said, send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in some water to cool my tongue. And Abraham says, he can't go there. There's a great gulf between us. We can't get from there to there. And then the, the rich man says, well, then send him back because I have five brothers and tell them I don't want them to have to come here. I, I believe that any person who was ever in hell for five minutes, if they came back to earth would be, uh, uh, it's a bit of a pun, a flaming evangelist. <laughs> Abraham says to, says to the rich man, he says, if they don't believe Moses and the prophets, neither will they believe if one comes back from the dead. How, how do we know that's a true statement? Because one did come back from the dead. So after the cross is going to be the resurrection. This is, my, uh, this is my empty tomb drawing. And Jesus does come back from the dead and still today there are billions who do not believe. So this is, the, this is what's going on before the cross. There's one other thing going on before the cross. It's a very difficult story of Genesis chapter six. Genesis chapter six says that the uh, sons of God saw the daughters of men and they came and intermarried with them. And when it speaks of their offspring, it says that they 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 don't know how to translate the word, so we just have it, the Nephilim. And the phylum are the offspring. Now the sons of God is an ancient reference to angels. And so Satan, trying to keep the, Jesus from becoming a man, seeks to, uh, to thwart the, the actual uh, DNA of humanity. And there are some angels who intermarry with human women and they produce these weird, strange offspring, men of renown, giants, men of great strength, the Nephilim. And Almost all of these uh, uh, um, Greek mythology, Roman mythology, Marvel comic stuff comes from these strange human people that had some kind of supernatural abilities. It was so wicked that the Lord brings judgment on the entire world. And so we're talking about the days of Noah. And we know what happened because we have some allusions to that in the New Testament. Here's maybe, right now you're probably spinning, right? So flip with me over to 2 Peter. Go with me to 2 Peter chapter 2. Let me show you where it is. I want you to know I'm not making it up. 
2 Peter chapter 2, Peter is writing about uh, false prophets and teachers and the fact that they won't be spared eventually in God's judgment. And this is what he says in verse 4. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. For if God did not spare the angels that sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them into chains of gloomy darkness to be kept there until judgment. And then he goes on and we have some context about when that happened, verse five. And if he did not spare the ancient world, but he preserved Noah, and then he goes on and he compares that sin, the sin of the angels to verse six. And if he turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, then he goes on and he finally says, then you can trust him that the day of judgment, he said all the way down to end of verse nine, will most definitely come. Uh, you're in Second Peter. Just flip with me back to Jude. It's the, it's the tiny book before Revelation, before the last book of the of the Bible. Jude's just one chapter, so find verse six. Verse five starts with, now I want to remind you, so he's reminding us once again about the judgment of God, and in verse six he says, and the angels who did not stay, it's a very difficult phrase for us to translate, uh, the ESV says, within their own positions of authority. It means, uh, I think the King James says, and it left their first estate. They, 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 they left the realm of spirituality that they were supposed to live in. They left their proper dwelling. These angels, it says in verse six, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Once again, some context. What did these angels do that deserved that? Verse seven, they were just like the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah that we know were sexual sins, the sin of homosexuality. So, so this is what these angels did. And this phrase here, this gloomy, this dungeons, gloomy, is the, is, uh, is the phrase Tartarus. T-A-R-T-A-R-U-S. And it is a separate part of hell. And these angels have been put there ever since uh, Genesis 6. And that's where they are. Now, uh, these are fallen angels, right? I don't, I, you guys understand that? Demons. So they're using angels in their, in their most generic state. But these aren't angels with halos who are doing the will of God. These are angels who rebelled against God, left their first estate, tried to intermarry to spoil the lineage of Christ, and they are part of that judgment. And, and how, what, what would keep a demon, what would keep a demon from uh, procreating with a human today? Because God has ordained that if you do that, you go straight to Tartarus. You don't pass go. You don't get to wait until the end of the days. It's, it's literally what you read. Now you'll understand what you read. In Luke chapter 8, Jesus gets out of the boat in the, in the region uh, called the Gadarenes. And uh, there is a de demoniac there. And Jesus says, what's your name? And the demons answer and say, our name is Legion, for we are many. And uh, then the demon begins to beg Jesus not to send them to the abyss. That's another name for this. And, the, and in fact, the demon said, have you, come, have you come to torment us before the time? The, the demons know that they're going to lose. They know that the judgment is theirs. They know that at that time will come. They want to know if Jesus was going to send them straight to the abyss right now. Which, by the way, Jesus had all the authority to do. And they know that because some demonic beings are already there. They are already there. And so the scripture then says of these that that. Jesus did not send them to the abyss. I, I do not know the answer to why he did not. But instead, they asked him to send them into some pigs, 
Remember the story? And the pigs rushed off the cliff and drowned themselves, which proves it's better to be a dead pig than a demon-possessed pig. (laughs) So I give you all of that because now you have the ability to understand uh, this story of what happens. And let me just see if I, I might have cut off our reading of 2 Thessalonians 2 too soon. He's right there. So, um, so here's, here's the explanation of Ephesians chapter four. It starts with the death of Christ. Turn with me to uh, Matthew 27. I'm gonna work you over today. Some of you are just gonna leave with your heads spinning. It, it's fun though, isn't it? It's all here. You just got to take the time, delve into it and read it. Matthew 27 uh, is the story of uh, Jesus before Pilate and then the crucifixion. And we come to his death. So we come to that verse 50. I'm in Matthew 27, verse 50. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and he yielded up his spirit. This is the moment when the physical body of Jesus expires. And Matthew records, notice this, he records, first of all, number one, the curtain of the temple was torn in two. There was a veil, a heavy veil, like a, like a theatrical curtain, thick and velvet and uh, 30 feet high. That ceiling is like 20 feet high. You got 10 feet to the basket rim there. You got 10 beyond that. So it's another 10 and it's a curtain hanging all the way down that separates the holy place from the holiest place, the holy of holies. And at that moment, the scripture says that veil was torn in two, not from the bottom where you and I would have to tear it, but from the top where God tore it. And it's, it's a symbolic act that now, because of the substitutionary death of Christ, we have direct access to God the Father. Say amen. This is a wonderful part of what God does for us. So the curtain is torn in two, but uh, Matthew is not done yet. And the earth shook and the rock split. This is a good old-fashioned earthquake. We know also from the other gospels that the sky turned black and it was just like night. But then Matthew adds something that only he records. And the tombs also were opened and many of the bodies of the saints, not the unbelievers, but those who had been gathered to their people who were the saints, who were waiting for the redemptive work of Christ to be done. Many of the bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and coming out of the tombs. They continued to appear until after the resurrection and they went into the holy city, Jerusalem himself, and they appeared to many. So what really happens, the, the earthquake and the sky going dark and the curtain being torn in two are all symbolic. But what really happens here is that paradise is, is busted open. And they no longer have to wait. And there's just a little time when some of these from paradise wander out into Jerusalem. And so that's what happens there. And what happens with Jesus? Well, we know from Scripture, I'm going to do this now very rapidly because now you understand. We know from Scripture that he who ascended first descended. Jesus descends. He does not go to hell that he might be tortured or punished on our behalf. He took all of the wrath of the Father on the cross. And that was accomplished on the cross. He goes to Tataras to proclaim to those uh, angels in Tataras, I have won, you have lost, you are never going to be released from Tataras. It's a proclamation of that. And then Jesus comes by paradise and he takes these who were prisoners, who were captives, these who have been waiting for his redemptive work, and he's going to lead them to heaven. And the scripture says in uh, uh, Ephesians chapter four that he's going to give them gifts. 
And he's going to give them rewards. And this is the phrase. I'm not going to turn to these. Here's four places you can find it. You can find it in Acts 26, 23. You can find it in 1 Corinthians 15, 20. You can find it in Colossians 1, 8. You can find it in Revelation 1, 5. <clears throat> Jesus is the firstborn of many brothers. No one, no one, all the people who lived in the Old Testament, they did not get to heaven before Jesus. When all of the Old Testament saints were lined up, when, when paradise was finally broken over, uh, broken open by the redemptive work of the cross and Jesus went to heaven, he led them. He was the first one through heaven's gate. He's the firstborn of many brothers. He's the first fruits of salvation. He's the one who accomplished that for us. And imagine that day. Some of these who had been, uh, some of these had been in paradise for 2,000 years waiting for the redemptive work of Christ. And he busts open paradise. And so Ephesians 4 is the one who descended, is the one who ascended. And that's what he's talking about here. And he proclaimed to the angels that they had lost. He declared that. Nothing changes in Shoal. These people are not set free. They've rejected him. They still suffer that. And then on to this. Now we know that in three days, he returns here, right? So this is, only, this is only three days. And then we know that he's here for 40 days. And then he returns back to heaven. And then we know that there are 10 days. And the Holy Spirit is sent. And oddly enough, when the Holy Spirit comes, he comes with gifts, it's the most incredible thing. Who, who should get the gifts? Jesus should get the gifts. Jesus died my death for me. Je Jesus paid for my sin for me. Jesus d declared victory for me. Jesus came from heaven for me. Jesus should get all the gifts. But he gives the gifts. He gives rewards when these Old Testament saints get here and he gives these gifts. And what are these gifts? Some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be teachers, some to be uh, uh, servants in Christ, some to be administrators, some to be, help with healing, some to pray. That's the gifts that he gives. And so all of that's accomplished. Now it leaves us with another question and that is, well, okay, this is what life looked like before the cross. What does it look like after the cross? Turn with me to 2 Corinthians, will you? 2 Corinthians, find chapter 5. Now, now we can find this in lots of places, but I've just chosen this because I like this passage. So here you and I, you know, we do not live before the cross. We're not waiting for the Messiah to come. He's already come. The writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 9, Jesus is going to return again, but he's not going to return to deal with sin. He's already done that. He's going to return to receive us to himself. And by the way, when that happens for us, when you and I and the church is raptured or we go by the veil of death, when we go to heaven, guess what happens? More gifts, more rewards, crowns. And it's just too much for us. And so finally, there'll be a worship service there that Revelation records where we will take all our crowns and all our accolades and all our gifts and what can we only do with them? There's only one appropriate response. We fall down and we throw our trophies and our gifts at the feet of Jesus and we say, worthy is the lamb who was slain for us. That's still coming. Paul talks about between now and then and what happens to those that we love who die. So have you got, have you got, oh, I'm in 1 Corinthians. Here I come. Find 2 Corinthians 5. I'm almost there. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. The apostle Paul says, for we know. Now in chapter 4, he called our, he called our bodies uh, jars of clay. Now in chapter 5, he's going to call our bodies a tent. 
So a jar of clay is the most common everyday vessel of Old Testament times. In fact, the one thing that archaeologists find the most of in any archaeological dig are what they call shards, and they are broken clay jars. This is the single most common archaeological find. So you and I, our bodies are considered common. They're ordinary. And I know when, I know you guys, when you were young, used to stand in front of the mirror and you thought you were extraordinary. You now know that you're ordinary. And if you didn't, your wife will help you know that you're ordinary. So Paul is calling attention to our ordinariness. We are jars of clay in chapter four. We are tents in chapter five. We are not buildings. We are not beautiful structures. We are not uh, uh, great big towers of skyscrapers. We're tents. Some of us are kind of pup tents. For we know, verse one, that if the tent that is our earthly home, he's talking about your body, is destroyed, we have a building, not a tent. So now he's talking about eternity. He's talking about heaven. We have a building from God. Isn't it, uh, aren't you just sad for those who cling and try to hold this earthly body so long and they'll do every last possible experimental drug because they're so afraid of death? I, I see it with COVID now. I see people are so afraid to die. Death is a gift of God. You, you are not made to live in that tent forever. There is a building for you. There's a glorified body for you. We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, and it is eternal in the heavens. Verse two, for in this tent we groan. Let's just all do it together. Oh, in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on, we may not be found naked, for while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, better clothed, so that this mortal body may be swallowed up by life. This isn't real life. This is temporal, eternal life, abundant life is real. And then Paul gets to this. He says in verse five, he who has prepared us for this very thing. What is this very thing? It's eternity. He who has prepared us for eternity is God. In, in my Bible, this is underlined and exclamation pointed so in a little bit, I'm going to talk about, I don't have the room here that I wanted. In a little bit, we're going to talk about heaven. Heaven is the word used in the New Testament, not paradise. Paradise no longer exists. There isn't a paradise. You don't have to buy some candles and light them to get somebody out of purgatory. It, Jesus did all that on the cross. That's done. There is a heaven for us. And what is heaven? We know from 2 Corinthians 5, heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. That's what heaven is. Look, look at the verse again. He says, he who has prepared us for this is God. What did Jesus say in John 14? I go to prepare a place for you. A prepared place for prepared people. Not everyone goes to heaven. It is a nice secular Santa Claus kind of idea that is a myth. And, and primarily people don't go to heaven are people that don't want to. They don't want God. They reject him. They rebel against him. They, they hate his precepts. They hate his creative order, his divine order, and his redemptive order. And so Jesus would say to us later, don't worry if they hate you. They hate me before they hated you. But for those of us who love him, he has prepared a place for us. You say, how do we know this? And so the end of verse five is, he has given us the spirit as a guarantee. So uh, just imagine this moment just for a little bit, okay? So Jesus has done the work on the cross. 
He's come back from the grave. And, and by the way, so the three days here to go to Tartarus and proclaim to the angels that they lost and to break open paradise and to go to heaven, Jesus didn't need three days for that. The three days is for those of us on earth so that nobody could say, well, maybe he wasn't really dead. That's what the three days are for. The three days are so no one could say, I think he was just unconscious. No, he was dead, stone cold dead. That's what the three days are for. So he returns, but then he's only here for 40 days. At the end of this, he starts telling the disciples, I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave you. And it's, it's, it's better for me to leave. You know, if you were a disciple and you were there, you would say, I don't think so. I think it's better if you stay with me, Jesus. This, in fact, I'll just, I'll just stay with you. you. There's no way in the world you could think it would be better for him, for, for us. But he knew as long as he's on earth in a body, he's limited to a body. The Holy Spirit's not limited to that. The, the scripture says that the Holy Spirit indwells every single believer. In just a little bit, we're all going to depart from this place and we're all going to go a hundred directions. Does, does the Holy Spirit have to decide which of us he's going to go with? N no, because he's not constrained by a body. And so he says, it's going to be better for you. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is also our guarantee that there really is a heaven. And how do we know that? Because the Holy Spirit gives us these gifts, just like Jesus gave us these gifts, just like we're going to have these gifts here. It's, it's, a, it's divine. It's a part of what he does. Now, I haven't even got to the part that I really wanted to get to. Verse six. So, because we understand that the tent, even though we groan in it, is, we're not gonna stay in it, and there's a building, and it's heaven, and it's eternal, and God's prepared it. So, verse six, we are always of good courage. Is that you? Are you always of good courage? Are you sometimes of good courage? Are you ever of good courage? Where's, you think of what you have. You, know, you don't have to get down about the politics and the COVID. God's in charge of it all. He doesn't blink. He didn't make a mistake. He knows exactly what he's doing. We're still on plan A. We are always of good courage. We know. Now, here's, here's, here it is. We know that while we are at home in the body here on earth, we are away from the Lord. But here on earth, how do we live now? We walk by faith, not by sight. Everything has changed. If you're a believer and you're, and you're seeing the world through physical eyes, then of course you're not of good courage. But those of us who belong to the Lord, we are encouraged, we are strengthened because we walk by faith, not by sight. Verse eight, yes, we are of good courage and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. But whether we're at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. There you go. You say, well, what, do I, what am I doing in life? Uh, I'm retired now. I don't have a plan. This is it. We make it our aim to please him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. This is for believers. So that one day each of us may receive what is due for that which is done in his body. This is, there's more gifts coming. So here's what he's saying. Paul says in another place, to be Absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You and I live on this side of the cross. There's no waiting. There's no, there's no uh, soul sleep. There's no purgatory. These are, these are all myths that people have made up over the years. We, the, moment, the moment that your eyes close in death, they open to eternal life. I don't, I don't, there's, no, there's not even any, any in between. Jesus says in John 11 to Martha, if you believe in me, you will never die. And so unlike the Old Testament saints who were waiting for redemption to take place, they were waiting for the cross, you and I live on this side, we're immediately in heaven. Now for the, for the unbeliever, um, there's another place. And believe it or not, it's just incredible to me that the world doesn't want to believe in hell. And I, I, I was making fun a while ago of how it's used vulgarly 
but the world's a hell of a this and a hell of a that and a hell. They, they talk about hell all the time, but then they don't want to believe in hell. Your Bible talks more about hell than it does heaven. The Sermon on the Mount, and people say, oh, I love the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount says, man, if your right eye offends you, pluck it out. It's better to go through life with one eye than go to hell. It's, it's important that you understand it. Now, this got all kinds of names. Uh, Jesus used Gehenna probably more than anything else. Gehenna was the name for the dump outside of Jerusalem where they burned the trash and the refuge, uh, the dung, and, the, and it, was, it was eternal fires. Never, fire never went out in Gehenna. But we also have the word hell. We also have the word Hades. We also have the word second death. And we also have the word the lake of fire. And there are other words that also describe it. It's a place of outer darkness. It's a place of torment. It's a place of complete isolation. It's a place of being uh, separated from God. All of these things. And so this is how it's described. Here, very, very quickly, I'm running out of time. Just flip all the way over to the last book of your Bible. Find Revelation 19. We'll just read it out from 19 to the end. So how's it, how's it going to end for the unbelieving? How's it going to end for Satan? How's it going to end for the demons that have supported him? Uh, the first part of Revelation 19 is the Hallelujah Chorus. Find verse 20. Uh, Revelation 19, 20. And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet, who in its presence had done the signs by which he had deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image. And these two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. Uh, and the rest who were slain by the sword and that came out of the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse and all the birds gorged on their flesh continues. Chapter 20, find verse 10. It says in the, uh, well, verse nine is the end of the, defeat of Satan after the thousand years. Verse nine, and uh, all, Gog and Magog, and all those were numbered like the sand of the sea. Verse nine, and they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and their beloved city, that's Jerusalem. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them and the devil who had deceived them and they were thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet already were and they were tormented day and night forever and ever. You were created in the image of God so you're, you're, you're immortal in your creation. You can't die. Your spirit can't die. You're created in the image of God. So... Sometimes people think, well, hell is a place where you, there's some suffering, but then once you suffer, you're burned up, then it's over. N no. I meet people sometimes, they go, I'm not afraid of death, but I'm afraid of dying. That's what hell is. Hell is a place where you're always dying and never dead. Because you're immortal, you don't die. You're separated forever and ever. Find chapter 21, find verse eight. As for the cowardly and the faithless and the detestable, for murderers and the sexually immoral, for sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, and this is the second death. The first death is the death of your body. The second death is eternal death. We are always dying, never dead. This is for unbelievers. The unbelievers live one life and die two deaths. The one life they live is physical, and this physical body dies, that's death number one, and then the spirit dies forever in hell, that's death number two. The believer has one death and two lives. You live this life, and then this body dies. Say amen. amen. Yeah, you don't want this body forever, and then you get the next life. So your choice is two lives and one death or one life and two deaths. And once again, there isn't any waiting. It's not like you wait until the judgment and then you go to hell. Just as the believer closes their eyes in death, the believer is immediately in everlasting life. 
So the unbeliever closes their eyes in death and is immediately in everlasting torment. And so when you read Ephesians chapter four, now you know what it means. He who, how can he who ascended be the one who ascended if he didn't first descend? And we find this process of what God does. You and I are here. Just put a bookmark in the old 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Then when you groan in your tent, you know, oh, God understands that. And you can be of good courage because he prepared a place for you. And all you got to do, what does he say? What, what does God want me to do here on earth? Just please him. Just live a life that pleases the Lord. I told you you'd be mesmerized. Isn't that fun? Just one of many things. Your Bible's got stuff we still haven't discovered yet. So I open, you ever open your Bible and you read it and you go like, I don't ever remember reading that before. I know I've read it a hundred times. That's what makes it so good. It comes from an infinite God. It is so full of wisdom and it really does answer everything for us. Thank you.